It's very difficult for us, I think, in a country which is um, largely and in a world where some would say is increasingly secular, to think of sectarianism as a security threat. In the first census in Australia, 0.4% of the population uh, stated that they had no religion. Uh, in the last census, that was 22%. In New Zealand, that was 35%. So in Western established countries, secularism, in fact, a belief in no God, uh, is on the increase in proportional terms. So, but conversely, increasingly sectarianism is being seen as a genuine security threat for Australia. And I'll cover a few issues tonight with the caveat that an issue like this is always quite difficult for researchers to do because some of the detailed tactical level knowledge is um, classified. So what researchers can get hold of is normally open source material. And I'm sure there are some people here in the uh, audience who would have greater depth of knowledge and more current knowledge in some of the stuff that will be presented here today. And if, I'd welcome any comments that any of those people might have. Now, it might be quite difficult to understand why I would um, open a lecture on this subject with a view of Waverley Cemetery in Sydney. And it's not just because of its water views, but it's to give people an idea that in the not too, our not too uh, distant history, sectarianism was a very live issue in Australia, but for a different reason. That photograph there, for those of you who don't know it, which most of you don't, I imagine, uh, is the largest cenotaph and memorial to the Irish um, independence outside of Ireland. And it sits in Waverley Cemetery. It was built in 1898. Sectarianism was, for a large part of Australia's early history, a very live security issue. Because Catholicism tended to be identified with Irishness, and Irishness tended to be identified with nationalist tendencies. And that cenotaph there uh, is the reinterment site of Michael Dwyer, who was also known as the Chief of Wicklow, and in the 1798 rebellion was one of the leading Irish rebels. He was, gave himself up to the British, uh, on the understanding that he would be shipped to America, but perfidious Albion sent him to Australia instead. And he was a free man when he came, when he finished up here, and he was buried in what is now Devonshire Street next to Central Station. In 1898, on the 100th anniversary of the 1798 uh, anti-British rebellion, uh, Michael Dwyer and his wife were taken out of the ground in Devonshire Street and reinterred in Waverley Cemetery. There were 100,000 people lined the streets of Sydney to see his casket go past. And that was in the city of 450,000 people. And just to emphasise the religious nature of this, he was deliberately taken out of the ground and held in St Mary's Cathedral on Holy Thursday, night of the Last Supper, and taken to the cemetery on Easter Sunday in 1898. So the resurrection of Irish nationalism <coughs> wedded very closely with Catholicism. But it's not just an 1898 uh, cenotaph, because if you go around the back, uh, the names of Irishmen who died in the 1916 Easter Rebellion is also on the back. And underneath that uh, are the names of the IRA members who died in the hunger strike in May's prison in the 1970s. So very evocative and very religious in its own way. And in 1918 and 1919, some loyalty leagues were set up in Australia because there was a fear that the increasing Irish Catholic population would dilute British Protestant values. There were, Irish, there were loyalty leagues set up in South Australia, Western Australia and Tasmania. They didn't last very long, but they're indicative 
that Irishness and Catholicism were seen to be antithetical to Australian um, values, which were British values. Now, as well as sectarianism, the concept of foreign fighters is not uh, unusual to Australia. And those of you in the audience who are Canberrans, which I imagine all of you would instantaneously, I hope, know that that is in Yarralumla. And it's a monument to the 70 Australians who fought in the Spanish Civil War in the 1930s. Now, I'd hazard a guess there's not going to be a monument to Australian fighters in Syria, but it indicates it's a different nature of foreign fighter. By and large, with one exception, they were ideologues, socialists, communists, trade union members, some medical staff, who saw in the advance of fascist forces of General Franco, a force that had to be stopped because it was as an, ex it was an expansionist ideology, and history proved them right. 3,000 people uh, greeted some of the returnees on the docks in Sydney when they came back from Spain. And curiously, as a kind of historical anecdote, one person, a graduate from St Joseph's College, Hunters Hill, um, fought on the side of Franco's forces because he saw uh, the nationalists as godless communists and he fought as a Catholic, believing that the, uh, his Catholic identity meant he had to fight for General Franco's forces. He um, never returned to Australia. And in fact, he uh, joined the Royal Air Force and died as an aerial gunner in 1940. Fast forward to 1972 and something a bit more serious and with a bit more resonance to today. That rather blurry photo um, up there shows 19 members of the Croatian Revolutionary Brotherhood, 15 of whom were Australian all of whom did their own form of military training in New South Wales and then went to Germany in a rather quixotic adventure, believing that they could infiltrate into former Yugoslavia and instigate a rebellion and the Croatian people would rise up and create Croatia. Never actually happened, strangely enough. 15, and we think that all of the Australians were killed over the period of a couple of weeks by Yugoslav forces. Three were sentenced to death in trial in Belgrade, and one 20 year old was sentenced to 20 years in prison purely because of his age. Now, because they're Croatian, we don't know their religion, but it's probably safe to assume that they're all Catholic. But their Catholicism was not the reason they went to fight in former Yugoslavia, it was a nationalism national identity, not a religious identity. And this is one of the issues that we need to really look at. So fast forward to the 21st century. As we are all only too well aware, we have a new set of 21st century foreign fighters, and they are qualitatively and quantitatively different <coughs> from foreign fighters and view of sectarian identity that has come before. Now what motivates them? There is no one reason, and as we'll discover, there is no one solution. But I think most of you, at various points of time, would have heard on the radio a selected spokesperson or through the newspaper that person A went to Syria to provide humanitarian assistance to the people of Syria. Now, there's a good reason why they use those exact, that exact phrase because of the Foreign Incursions and Recruitment Act, which makes it illegal to go or provide um, assistance to somebody um, fighting in a foreign country unless you are providing humanitarian assistance. It doesn't say what form of humanitarian assistance that you're providing. You have to show no proof of it. So if you go and you don't appear as a fighter, it's very difficult to get a conviction. So when people say they're going to provide humanitarian assistance, I tend to take it with a grain of salt for this reason. Now, the Independent National Legislation Security Monitor, National Security Legislation Monitor, has picked up on this, and one of his recommendations in the last couple of months is to, uh, for an amendment to the bill, is to amend the nature of humanitarian assistance that you can uh, get away from being prosecuted so long as you are providing humanitarian assistance through a recognised humanitarian body 
that might be one of those standing bodies we're all familiar with, or it might be through a body that has tax exempt status in Australia, so has had some kind of uh, oversight placed on it. So probably in the next few months that will pass um, and you'll be far less likely to hear somebody saying they died providing humanitarian assistance um, and if they do then the onus will be on them to describe what the humanitarian organisation it was that they were providing assistance through or to. So what are some of the other reasons? You know, religion is the obvious and um, significant motivating factor. There's no real getting away from this. And when you look at sectarian conflicts in the past, it's always been, religion has been part of the mix, but by no means all of the mix. It's a motivating factor, rarely the motivating factor. In some instances it is, but it's normally mixed up with other issues of identity. National identity, nationalism is a very powerful tool, and your religion might be part of your national identity, but it's not necessarily the only reason. Ethnicity is another motivating factor. Sometimes religion is combined with that. So religion and sectarian identity might be part of it, but it's really the only part of it. And you will often hear in uh, some of the justification for um, Muslim youth going that they need to fight against oppression, which is always a very relative and loaded term, but it is religiously significant and a motivating factor. And probably for those who are religiously committed, the largest, the most significant motivating factor. The second one there, which is a religious issue about the desire to uh, implement an Islamic State is a much less, uh, much weaker um, motivating factor or a motivating factor in far fewer of the people. It'll be very interesting to see uh, now with um, the Islamic State or ISIS's um, proclamation of a caliphate, whatever that means, whether this issue becomes more of a motivating factor in the months ahead. National or ethnic affinity to the conflict being waged. Now, there's a strong argument that one of the reasons, um, more Australians at least, are heading to Syria is they have an affinity with the country besides the religious significance of Bilad Asham, the fact that you are next to Lebanon where the majority of the Australian Muslim population comes from, gives you an affinity that you wouldn't have had in, say, Bosnia or Somalia or other um, hotspots. And lastly, and in some cases most significantly, there's that issue of identity, how you identify yourself and your religious identity becomes much more powerful because you fail to identify with the country in which you live for a variety of reasons. You might be poorly educated, um, haven't been able to secure the kind of job that you want, your family has never been able to give the education in the classic uh, immigrant sense where you advance to the next economic level and become more integrated in society, you become on society's um, periphery. And religion and a calling and a belief to fight against oppression gives you exactly the kind of identity that you crave and a relevance in broader society that you never had before. That can be a strong motivating factor. Familial links, as we'll see, is also tied in with that. And probably, uh, out of all of those reasons, and it's a grab bag of reasons, that last one is the one that is the most difficult to override or to argue against. Now, some of the, uh, as I said before, the um, issue of how people are motivated and the public reasons and the real reasons. The person up there, I was the first Australian uh, to die in uh, Syria, Sheikh Mustafa Majoub, uh, in August 2012. If you look at the photo on the left, uh, he fits the narrative that his family and others gave that he died in a rocket attack that hit the mosque that he was in providing humanitarian assistance to the poor oppressed people of Syria. So a very good narrative and the kind of narrative that could attract other people. Or you could believe the picture on the right, 
which is allegedly Sheikh Mustafa Majoub as a fighter in Syria, where some sites said that he died during an attack leading his group of armed men. That doesn't fit with the narrative of humanitarian assistance that his family and closer community would like portrayed. Roger Abbas, man on the left, again killed in crossfire in a refugee camp providing humanitarian assistance. Refugee camps never named, humanitarian assistance he was providing never named, and the Islamic uh, Council of Victoria said that he left on his own to provide humanitarian assistance. Counter to that narrative is the fact that he was allegedly fighting for Jabhat al-Nusra, and the man on his right, one of his training partners at the same gym in Melbourne, who allegedly left at the same time as him, so he didn't go alone, um, was also killed in Syria, Sami Salma. Ahmed Musali on the left, and Yusuf Ali and his 22-year-old wife, uh, Amira. Some of you may remember that story. Both, again, had personal links. Both were street preachers in Sydney. Yusuf, a convert, Ahmed, of Lebanese background. But again, connected and allegedly um, set to Syria with the uh, assistance of Hamdi al-Qudzi, who has been um, awaiting trial for facilitation. And this last group, which I mentioned before, the people who sit on the periphery of uh, society in which they are, whose identity um, has waxed and waned until they found what they believe in. Um, most of you will have seen screenshots of the man on the left, Khaled Sharouf, who's already done four years jail in Australia for plotting terrorist attacks. And the man on the right, uh, Muhammad El Omar, um, both of whom allegedly fighting for ISIS. Muhammad El Omar um, Senior, his uncle, currently doing 21 years in the big house for plotting terrorist attacks. And his um, brother, Ahmed, um, convicted for the Hyde Park riots. Um, and allegedly the 18-year-old who blew himself up uh, and killed five Shia in Baghdad well, had familial links with Khalid. Sharif and the Sharif family. Um, again, this is probably the last of those groups that we spoke about, their motivation, a lack of identity in identifying with their host country, and they found a cause that suited them. This is just a brief slide and it's incomplete, um, just because one of the vi um, Problems with uh, doing this kind of open source research, just to give people an idea of Australians are being killed. It's an incomplete, as I said, and the year they were killed, just to, very difficult if you're talking about potentially 60 Australians who are fighting in Syria, 150 uh, Syria and Iraq, 150 providing assistance, which are the publicly uh, given numbers, perhaps 10 to 20 who've returned. Uh, we don't know all of their backgrounds in open source, so all we can go off is uh, the 12 to 13 that we know about here. Um, and the things that tend to fall out to you are ethnic. This is and one of the reasons why this issue is quite different to others because it's very hard to pin down. Um, ethnicity is not necessarily um, a motivating factor. You can see there's a majority of Lebanese, but you would expect a majority of Lebanese. It's the largest population. But we've got Turks fighting in an Arab country. We've got Australian converts um, allegedly members of Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula killed in Yemen. We've got converts in Syria. So ethnically, a mixed group. All young. And joining different groups. Now that might not be their choice. It might be the fact that whatever facilitation network they were put into, that's where you end up and you really had no choice. Some you might have, may have gravitated to once you crossed the border but it's very difficult to make definitive statements about the backgrounds of people because this um, current threat encompasses um, a different mix. 
And to add to that, the uh, two people who are awaiting um, trial on um, Hamdi al-Qudsi is Palestinian uh, for facilitation and one of the facilitators but who was also stopped at the airport on the way um, to Syria was uh, Somali. So again, another uh, ethnicity thrown into the mix. Um, I'm cognizant of the time. Now what makes this a bit different to um, those previous issues of foreign fighters or even um, what makes it more attractive, taking away the geographic um, and ethnic attraction because of uh, the Arab population. As you've seen there, being Arab doesn't necessarily guarantee that you're going to end up in, um, in Syria fighting. One of the most powerful tools, and I'll, this is um, one of the focuses for the rest of the talk, is Gen Y jihadists, the power of social media. Not only the power of social media, but um, the inability of community leaders in Australia in particular to address the nature of the threat and to address the medium by which this threat is being transmitted uh, to citizens in this country. Now, those all of you will know the traditional kind of powers uh, and ways to counter violent extremism that we've been uh, undertaking, increasing large number of withdrawals of passports. There's prosecutions which are, um, haven't yet gone to court, but people have been charged and they'll be going to court in the next few months. Surveillance, all the traditional powers that are open to government. And within the community, countering violent extremism programs, youth forums, you know, traditional interaction. And make no doubt, the clerical community, Islamic clerical community in places like Sydney and Melbourne, are very active at the local level in dissuading youth from travelling to Syria. So they're not inactive. My argument, as you'll come on to, is um, they don't understand um, modernity and how you get the messaging across. It's a leadership issue, it's not an activity issue because they're doing plenty of action, just misdirected action. And hopefully, uh, this first video is one of the leading um, places uh, looking at uh, radicalisation on the internet is King's College in London and The Guardian put a very, I'd recommend you look at this whole um, video uh, in future in your alone time, but I'll just show you the first couple of minutes because it goes to that fact about why Syria and increasingly Iraq is so different to other theatres of conflict. It's public, it's immediate, and you're really living the problems in close to real time. And in the social media, environment, groups like Jabhat al-Nusra, groups like ISIS in particular, produce high quality social media videos, real time tweets, and really understand their target audience. They use Arabic speakers to attract Arabs, Turkish speakers to attract Turks, and as you see in this, and some of you will have seen, um, they also use native English speakers to attract Westerners. Okay, even just the production values in that, if you want to join the Jihad, Jihad there looks pretty good. There's a nice green background, you're not in crappy desert. Uh, all your clothes are very clean, uh, weapons are clean, it all looks quite nice really. Um, this is the kind of attention to detail that they put in those kind of videos. It's not the harsh um, desert background, people have been on operations for weeks. It's pleasant, it's serene. It's the kind of thing that you want to do. But where the Australian uh, clerical Muslim leadership has been um, failing to lead has been in responding to that kind of stuff in the same medium in which it's being presented. In community meetings and in forums, you get a few people um, at a certain point in time, but you don't get lots of people repetitively that listen to your message and more importantly, argue against it in a very unequivocal way using religiously qualified people. 
And I'll just show you briefly this next um, video. It was put out the... Um, that video that you just saw before where there was the one Australian talking about used guys. Um, there was another Australian at the other end and there were three British South Asian uh, Muslims. So the UK had as more if not greater interest uh, than Australia did. But in contrast to Australia's clerical leadership, this is what a group called uh, Islam Online put together in the UK very shortly after that recruitment video was, um, was outlined. So quite a slick video, you'd have to agree. Uh, unequivocal, you'd have to agree. Um, it's very rare that in a public discourse, in this country I've heard ISIS described by our clerical leadership as cowboys or terrorists, but very publicly described there. And more importantly, three Sunni clerics, two Shia clerics, South Asians, a mix. Just showing the unity, it can be a very powerful message. Will that influence any potential jihadis? Who knows? But you're out there in the same medium that they are. So you're competing against the message, which is the important thing. Very, very difficult to ever understand what influence you have, but you can guarantee if you're not out there, you have zero influence. And when I say out there, I mean in the social media out there. People um, quoted that Musa Sarantino, who's just returned to Australia, is the third most influential ideologue for Jabhat al-Nusra. When you work out how they came up with that, um, it was based on the number of hits on his um, sites. That number of hits doesn't equate to influence, and you can probably guarantee half of those are from security agencies, so I don't think they're <laughs> necessarily going to be influenced by it, and take probably a quarter is probably from academics, so you're probably whittling down the numbers. So very difficult just because somebody has lots of hits on their site to say they're extremely influential. They're influential if they get a person from point A to fight at point B. But very difficult to prove that. Just because you've got hits on your site doesn't mean you're influential. In the same way that I don't know how influential that video has been. But it's a pretty impressive video in the same way that the recruitment video was impressive. It's cross-cultural, it's cross-sectarian, and it's unequivocal. In contrast, what's the Australian response been? Well, it depends where you go. Um, in the social media world, virtually anonymous. Grand Mufti of Australia, grand title. Um, that's his Facebook page. If you scroll down some of the comments, um, people are asking the Grand Mufti if you could please um, put on some of his comments on his Facebook in English or at least translate his Arabic ones because they'd like to read it but they can't. Not very influential. He has been silent on the issue of Syria. Very difficult in some of the communities where he's Egyptian, so not same nationality as the two largest Muslim communities in Sydney, Lebanese and the Turks. So he has some issues there. But so he sometimes thinks he comes from a position of weakness and he doesn't have the authority, so he's got to be very careful about what he says. I would argue the opposite. You don't get a following until you lead can't lead from behind. So the Australian, Australian National Imams Council, again, very static website. Um, they issued a press release. They get together in forums about twice a year. They issued a press release um, 18 months after Sheikh Mustafa Majzoub died, um, telling people not to go to Syria. What happened in the 18 months in between is the question. Why the day after reports came that Sheikh Mustafa Majoub died wasn't the clerical community out there saying, if these reports are true, yeah, it's haram and giving the religious reasons for why you are not to do it as opposed to hiding behind a fig leaf of humanitarian assistance. Member of the uh, Australian National from Lebanese community, 18 years old, blew himself up 
about a week ago, killed five people in Baghdad. If that's not a cause for concern, if that's not a cause for comment, I really don't know what is. But if you look at the press releases on the Australian National Imams Council, you'll find no reference to it. But you will find references to uh, the pernicious invasion of Israel into Gaza and a press release um, saying that the head of the New South Wales Police Counterterrorism Department um, gave them unfair criticism by saying they weren't doing enough. Lebanese Muslim Association, again, static website. Lebanese Muslim Association, um, any mention of the seven Lebanese who've been, who we know of, have been killed in Syria, or the one Lebanese Australian who blew himself up and killed five Shia? Nada. However, there is a press release about the Israeli invasion of Gaza from the Lebanese Muslim Association. It's this kind of inability to grapple with real live issues that affect the broader community in the kind of medium that those messages are going out, i.e. social media, that confines the clerical leadership uh, to near irrelevance. They attend forums, um, they do community engagement. At the local level, they are very active, as I said but you need to be public about it. It has to be zero tolerance, and it has to be zero tolerance from the start. What happens if there's another theatre of operations and then the Islamic clerical leadership says, no, for this one, it's forbidden? Because people obviously say, yeah, but what about Syria? You never said it was forbidden there. Why is it not forbidden there, but now forbidden there? It's a whole notion that if you allow any light in between the arguments, then in some way you weaken your own argument somewhere further down the track. And I don't think they truly understand A, the gravity of the issue, or B, how to grapple with it. The modern way that communications and that people are influenced, not the old way, which is the way they're still trying to do it. Okay, so what are the consequences of all of this? The terrorist threat in Australia from returning um, jihadis the only kind of academic study on this is Thomas Heghammer's uh, Norwegian defence researcher who said, you know, one in nine uh, people who fought overseas have plotted or have an intent to attack in the country in which they come from. But even he said it was very difficult to research. He could only go off um, known attacks um, that happen in countries, so that part of the equation was solid, but he could only um, use the data of foreign fighters overseas that he knew about. And obviously there are a lot more than he knew about. So one in nine is based on the figures that he knew. So the figures are actually um, smaller than that, more like one in 15, one in 20. So the number of people, there is a, an academic view that you can intellectually disassociate yourself from your home, your home country from the theatre in which you're operating in. You fight in Syria, you come back to Australia, you don't fight. But if you're the government, that's the most serious threat. You have to legislate for the most serious threat, not necessarily the most likely threat. But obviously, you will pick up military training, but there's degradation of skills. Not everybody coming back is some expert bomb maker. Many will not have ever seen an explosive device. They will have fired a, a rifle or fired a few rockets. Getting from that level to be able to do um, detonate explosive device in Australia takes a significantly larger degree of training. So not everybody is a potential bomb maker when they come back. The longer term issues are probably the more important issues for two reasons. One, if you're somebody who's returned from Syria, amongst some elements of the community, unless you have been by the community leadership um, roundly criticised from the start, for some people you'll be a role model. You're a person of action. You just didn't talk about things from um, during your khutbah on Fridays. You went out and did something. So for some people, you are potentially an anti-role model. But more importantly, I think, in the long term, are the linkages that these people are going to make. No Australian's been killed um, 
by Islamist terrorists in Australia, but over 100 have been killed overseas by Somalis in Kenya, by Indonesians in Bali and Indonesia, by Saudis in America, by South Asian British nationals in the UK. Those kind of plots take planning. They also take planning that involves perhaps financial assistance from people, perhaps travel assistance, perhaps documentary assistance, all these kind of facilitation networks. They don't necessarily happen naturally, but we are potentially creating 150 to 200 people who may have links, established links, in Syria and Iraq that might lie dormant for 5, 10, 15 years until out of the blue somebody wants some financial assistance that you knew from your days um, back in Aleppo. Of course, I'll provide it to you. Where that goes, nobody knows. And I think it's those linkages, not the people running down George Street in Sydney shooting an AK-47 because that's not likely to happen, but an Australian being killed overseas as a result of a plot that involved somebody at some stage who had connections uh, with other people as a result of their service in Syria. That's why they need to be identified, that's need to, why they need to be stopped from going in the first instance. And again, I don't think the Islamic clerical leadership understands this. They think the threat is somebody running down George Street with a gun so they can calm that situation. That's not the threat. The threats are the linkages, not necessarily the actions that these people are going to do. Okay, so lastly, have we failed? You would have to ask yourself, um, we have never had more foreign fighters overseas. We have never had more people assisting foreign fighters overseas. Since 2011, we've spent $5 million, or more than $5 million, on countering violent extremism um, programs. They, you can take two views of that. If we hadn't done those, that's the subjective view, if we hadn't done those, the problem would be even greater. But either way, or the objective view, that zero foreign fighters is what you're aiming for, so 60 foreign fighters is unacceptable and 150 people assisting them is even more unacceptable. So whether you take the subjective or the objective view, it's a problem. You can only do so, many, so much more in countering violent extremism, you only legislate for so much. And I come back to that central argument, which I kind of leave on, is that the one missing element of this is community clerical leadership. And a clerical leadership that is very public, clerical leadership that is cross-cultural because one of the issues is a disaggregated community leadership. You need to have videos like that Imam's online video that speaks to the population in a medium that they understand, in a language that is inclusive, that is unequivocal and the unequivocal nature is probably the most important bit. There has to be zero tolerance. Because the future challenge is that over the last 10 to 15 years, the information revolution has meant that what's happening in Syria is beamed in either through the news or you can go on websites where you can see uh, uploaded vision of fighting you know, an hour or two after it occurred. It's visceral, it's real, it's very influential. That's not what's happened in the last decade. Where are we going to be in the next five years? How much more immediate is it going to be? And how much easier is it for you to be a geographic, a geographic Australian? And I mean by that, stay in a, one particular part of one particular city, get your news feeds in your mother tongue, with all its subjectivity from single sources and live on social media that just feeds the narrative that you've already implicitly have in yourself and it just confirms it for you. If you don't have competing narratives coming at you from people that you respect, law enforcement agencies and the, and the Commonwealth, um, if you're going to go and fight overseas, you've already disregarded their direction, so you're not going to listen to them. You need religious guidance in an unequivocal way in a medium that reaches you no matter where you are. And I'll probably leave it to that.